is uh, Dr. Andy Persily, who runs the Indoor Environment and Ventilation Group at, Na at the National Institute of Technology in the United States. Andy's been one of the leaders in ventilation research for 30 years. He's also been um, very active in standards in the ventilation area uh, within ASHRAE and uh, the American Society for Testing and Materials, ASTM. So Andy's going to talk about field measurements involving building ventilation. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and at this incredible conference in this incredible city of Hong Kong and to be addressing you all. We just heard two very good and very interesting talks about how air moves inside ventilated spaces. And I'm going to take a slightly different perspective and talk about how much air comes into the building and how we measure how much air comes into the building. Um, and uh, my, the, the topics I'm going to discuss today is first, why we measure ventilation. It's, it's not just because it's a lot of fun, but because it's important. Some of the problems um, that exist in our research community regarding how ventilation rates are measured and how ventilation rate measurements are reported. Talk a little bit about terminology, talk about the quantities that we measure and what they tell us and the methods that we use to measure those quantities. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some case studies of ventilation rate measurements and uh, to highlight the kind of things we can learn when we measure ventilation rates in the field. I've never gone to a building and measured things and not learned something. So field measurements are, are always uh, uh, very informative. And finally, I'll close with a couple of challenges regarding the measurements of uh, measure of ventilation rates in the field. So the first question is why measure a ventilation rate in a building? And the answer is because it's important. The ventilation we bring into the building reduce the concentrations of contaminants generated in the space. But sometimes, or, or perhaps too often, the air we bring into the building carries contaminants with it and raises those concentrations. Also, the air we're bringing into this building today needs to be cooled and dehumidified, and that consumes energy. Obviously an important concern. To some people, it's the most important concern, but we know better. Thermal comfort. Uh, Arson just talked about all the attributes of the indoor environment that impact thermal comfort, and ventilation rates impact you know, those parameters. And finally, the materials in a building um, the building envelope materials can be impacted by ventilation rates depending on how the air is brought in, depending a lot on how moisture is dealt with and the interactions between the air flows and the envelope. You can um, increase the likelihood of, microbial, of condensation leading to microbial growth as well as uh, corrosion of metals if these considerations aren't well handled. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the problem that, that I've, uh, I and others have observed in this field. Arson mentioned this study, uh, which was really important. It was a study of, of an analysis of 26 research studies looking at ventilation rates and measured health outcomes. And ve very important work, and I'm one of the et al's, so um, I'm being self-critical here. And I looked at the ventilation rate measurements that were reported in these 26 studies. And there's a paper published in the Proceedings of Indoor Air 20, 2011, myself and Hal Levin. We looked at the ventilation measurement methods, the metrics that were reported, and how complete the descriptions of these ventilate rate measurements were. And the, uh, oops, there we go. The, uh, these are the conclusions of that analysis. They are not the conclusions of my keynote. Um, the, uh, we, so we looked at these 26 studies, and we found that in only 10% of them, they didn't describe how the ventilation rates were determined. They just said, here, it was one air change an hour. Where was it measured? How was it measured? When was it measured was not reported. If somebody, you know, um, tried to... Uh, present 
an indoor air quality study where they told you the benzene concentration, but they never told you how they measured it or where they measured it, I think we would all be very critical for good reason. Ventilation is no different than that. 25% uh, of these studies, they used carbon dioxide as a metric of ventilation despite the problems associated with determining ventilation rates with carbon dioxide concentration. I'll talk about those in a minute. Three quarters, they didn't describe the time scale of the measurement. Was it instantaneous? Was it a two hour average? You know, over what time period? Um, that's important information. Half of them didn't describe the instrumentation used. You know, how do you interpret a measurement where you don't know how it was measured? And finally, only four of the measurements, more, only four of the 26 studies gave you any information on the uncertainty associated with the measurement. Uh, a measured value without an uncertainty is not a, a complete report. So this is the problem that we're facing in the field, and it's, a, it's an important problem. So I'm trying today to provide some information on the importance of measuring ventilation rates, how it's done, and what you can learn. So a, a little bit of terminology for those who aren't familiar with it. So here's the ventilation, ventilated space um, where the uh, people are doing their breathing. And this is a very simple schematic of a ventilation system. Brings in air, conditions it, delivers it to the space. Some of that air is pulled back out, exhausted to the outside, and then recirculated back with new outdoor air. Don't want to go through this in detail. I want to highlight two things. The first is outdoor air. Um, Sometimes we use the term fresh air, and that's not the best term because it may not be fresh. Too often in too many locations, the air is not fresh. It's definitely outdoors, but uh, keep in mind that that air may not be of such high quality. And if it isn't, you need to talk to our next speaker about how to clean it up. Uh, another factor I want to point out here is infiltration. A lot of buildings, especially in the US, can be very leaky and a lot of air can enter through leaks, through, through those leaks. Um, and it can be a very important um, a, a fraction of the total air entering a building. Now this diagram is biased to mechanical ventilation. And it's important to remember that natural ventilation can be a very viable option for ventilating buildings in many situations and consume, can consume you know, can greatly decrease the energy associated with, with building ventilation. So here are all the defined terms. I'm not going to read it, and I'm not going to leave it up long enough for you to read. But these, most of these come from ASHRAE Standard 62.1 and the paper that will be generated by this, uh, associated with this, uh, this uh, talk today. We'll get into these in more detail. Here's a few more terms that aren't in the figure, and I just want to highlight two of them. The first being ventilation. It's important to understand that different people use this term differently. For some people, when they say ventilation, they mean outdoor air. And other people, when they say ventilation, they just mean the air coming out of the vents. And I, I don't know if that's a vent or not, but I'm going to pretend it is. And, and to them, they're, that's ventilation air. And I don't know if there's any outdoor air in that airstream. I'd have to go back to the system, wherever it is, and look at the damper settings to, under, to know whether there is any outdoor air there or not. But it's important to realize that, again, when some people say ventilation, they mean outdoor air. When other people say ventilation, they mean supply air. And so be clear with your colleagues when you talk. Um, the other term I want to highlight is air tightness. This is the physical air tightness of the building envelope, which impacts the infiltration rate. Again, in the US, many of our buildings are quite leaky. In other countries, pr primarily in Scandinavia, they do a great job. There's an old adage, build tight, ventilate right. It's many decades old, and that's the approach that we advocate in, my, in mechanical buildings, mechanically ventilated buildings. So what do we measure? There's three primary quantities. The outdoor air change rate the amount of air brought into the building, and we can report it in different units, the amount of air brought in by the ventilation system, and the, finally, the envelope infiltration rate. I'll talk about all of these a little bit. 
On the outer air intake, I want to note that you measure it, but somewhere there is a design value. And it's important to understand what the system is supposed to be doing to, to fully interpret the results of your measurements. So um, when you measure a ventilation rate in a building, you know, it's, it's important to understand the system, how it's supposed to operate, how much air it's supposed to bring in. Oh, and, and there's some other parameters that people report. Carbon dioxide concentrations. Carbon, dioc carbon dioxide concentrations in a ventilated space can be very informative. They're related to the ventilation per, per, per occupant. It can be very useful. Relating that to a ventilation rate is a different um, a different, different story. I'm going to talk about that. It's, it can be done, but it's not as easy as some people think. Sometimes you see ventilation rates described as a low rate or it's a high rate. Very subjective. A low rate in a hospital is, is a high rate in a home, and it's better to have a number. You know, what you think is low, I might not think is low. I used to think 60 was very old. I, I uh, know better now. It's, it's not very old. Uh, and envelope air tightness is an important quantity. I mentioned it before. If you're trying to understand the ventilation characteristics of the building, the envelope air tightness is an important quantity um, to measure. So how do you measure out their air change rates? Uh, I want to uh, point out that the air change rate is the total air rate at which air enters the building. It includes what the system is bringing in, and it includes the leakage through the envelope. The way to do this is through tracer gas dilution. I have, there's an ASTM standard, there's an ISO standard, and other, a lot of other good documentation. There are three primary techniques, decay, which I'll talk about, constant concentration, which I won't, and constant injection, which I'll talk about. It's important to, uh, to understand that these techniques, as applied in the field, are based on a single zone mass balance, typically. That means that the tracer gas concentration needs to be uniform throughout the entire building with, you know, some latitude. And, you know, that can be done in many buildings, but in some other buildings it's very hard to achieve. And if, if you don't, you know, um, if you're not, con your, your situation is not consistent with that single zone assumption, you can't, you shouldn't be using these techniques. You can use them, but your results you know, can be subject to significant error. Um, given that, that fact, you know, people will do a tracer gas decay test in an individual room, and they will get a tracer gas decay rate, but depending on the interactions of that room with the rest of the building, that decay rate is not necessarily the air change rate of that room. So be very careful studying an individual room in a larger, more complex building. Air change rates vary with weather. They vary with the system operation. If to fully characterize or to, to really understand the ventilation characteristics of the building, you need to make multiple measurements under different weather conditions and different operating conditions. Um, getting back to that single zone situation, there are multi-zone tracer techniques, but they're really complicated. They're, and, uh, but they, they do exist. And when you have a naturally ventilated building, it can be very difficult to do these tracer gas measurements because of the mixing assumption and other factors. I'm a little skeptical of some of the rates I see reported um, in naturally ventilated buildings because it is such a challenging measurement. So here's tracer gas decay measurements. Again, a single zone mass balance of species in the space, spe the species being the tracer gas that you inject. And this is a, a photograph of an automated tracer gas system that we use in our research house. So you inject the tracer into the space, you allow it to mix for a period of time, maybe you help it mix until it's uniform or sufficiently uniform in the space, and then you monitor the decay of, of tracer gas concentration over time, and the slope of the log of concentration versus time is your air change rate. Sounds easy, and, and sometimes it is, but there, there, there it, it can be uh, uh, challenging in some buildings. Tracer gas decay is not new. Here's a, a reference from the mid-1930s. I have an older one, but I couldn't find it last week, and it's in German. 
but uh, it's been around for a long time. This uh, paper, they used hydrogen as their tracer gas, not something I'd recommend uh, that, that you do without very uh, good um, safety situation. But uh, every now and then, I will get a paper to review by someone who has rediscovered the tracer gas decay techniques. And I'll tell them, I'm sorry, this is not new. And I'll send them the German paper from the 1920s to look at. Tracer gas uh, constant injection. We actually heard about this early, earlier on. Here you inject the tracer at a constant rate and measure the concentration. In some situations, this is a, a, a very appropriate technique. And uh, you can solve, you, I won't get into the details here, but this is the basis for the long-term PFT measurements that, that have been around for, for several decades. And if you look at the math, there's an inherent bias when you do these long-term measurements um, that, that you need to be careful about. This is also the basis of the use of peak CO2 concentrations for estimating ventilation rates which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, this is a, um, uh, can be a very useful technique. I can't see red very well. This is a, can be a very useful technique for measuring flow rates in ducts. And our first speaker talked about that, how you inject the tracer gas at one end of the duct, and then you measure the concentration further down. So, Estimating ventilation rates with peak carbon dioxide. It's very commonly done. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, those the people doing the measurements don't understand the single zone mass balance theory on which the measurements are based and have, haven't validated the assumptions that are required. It's a very simple equation, but it requires you to know the generation rate of CO2 in the space, which depends on the people, and sometimes we just kind of use the number that's in, you know, written down in one place. But the generation rate depends on the, the individual, their size, their activity, and it can be a little dangerous to just use the simple value because it can vary so much. Also, there are many assumptions um, associated with this, that including the occupancy being constant, the outdoor air concentration being constant, and the ventilation rate being constant. You need to verify that those are, in fact, valid before you make these estimates and believe the results. Um, the, the CO2 concentration has also had to reach equilibrium for that equation to be valid. And again, these assumptions are not always appreciated and evaluated in some measurement um, programs, um, but not all. There is an ASTM standard uh, listed at the bottom that describes you know, the conditions required to make these measurements and uh, some of the issues associated. Ventilation system airflow rates, are, the first speaker um, described this very well. I won't go into it in, in much detail, just to highlight a couple of things. The, you know, the, we have the traverse method, using a pitot tube or a hot wire in a duct. You know, that requires, you know, some, a, a good, well, uh, ideally you have a fully developed flow when you do that traverse, which is, can be very difficult to achieve in many installations. A lot of ventilation systems are cramped for space and the designers um, don't have the room for all those duct lengths to get the flow conditions that are conducive to an accurate measurement. Measuring, doing a traverse in an outdoor air intake can be extremely challenging because those configurations are very short, very few duct lengths it's more like fractions of a, of a, a uh, duct diameter, a very hard measurement to make. The tracer gas technique that first speaker mentioned that I mentioned a minute ago is another option, and there's an ASTM standard uh, to do that. You can also, uh, in many situations, you want to know how much air is being delivered to the room, and one way to do that is with a flow hood, as shown in that picture there. Um, but remember, I measure the the air coming out of that vent, I don't know how much is outdoor air. I need to go back to the system to check on that. There's issues with accuracy um, associated with this technique. And if you do a lot of these measurements, your arms get very tired. So uh, be careful with that. Building infiltration, mentioned that earlier. That's the leakage, that's the air entering the building through leaks in the envelope. It's driven by wind, 
temperature difference and the operation of some building equipment. Running an exhaust fan will increase infiltration. Having an atmospherically vented combustion appliance pulls air out of the building and decreases the pressure. Uh, in the US, in, at least in office buildings, to the first order, the amount of air entering through leakage is, a, is the same as the amount entering through the intake, which is a bad situation. Infiltration is a bad way to ventilate a building. It's uncontrolled, it's unfiltered, it's unconditioned. Talk about air distribution problem. You know, it comes in where the pressure tells it to come in. It doesn't come in where the people need it. Um, building air tightness, that's the physical air tightness of the envelope. We measure that with a pressurization test. We blow air into the building to raise the pressure to a certain level. If it's a leaky building, you gotta blow a lot of air in to get it up to that pressure. But if it's a tight building, you don't have, you can blow in much less air to get it pressurized. That's done in homes with blower doors. Um, bigger buildings require bigger fans. But if it's a real tight building, even if it's big, you can get away with a smaller one. So a few case studies um, that I've been involved in um, over the years to kind of show you what we can learn when we go to a building and make ventilation measurements. Um, here's a study of many buildings with many measurements. This was reported in 1989 at an ashtray, I think we were in San Diego for the IAQ 89 conference. This is several thousand decay measurements in office buildings throughout the US. And the um, interesting thing here one of the interesting things here is just um, under half of those measurements were below the requirement ASHRAE standard 62, 1989. Now these buildings were not necessarily designed to that standard, but that was a useful benchmark. So in some, if, if you believe the number in the standard, half of those buildings were underventilated. We also compared the measured ventilation rates to the design values. And again, about half of the, the measured ventilation rates were below the design minimum. Underventilated according to the design, whether there's an indoor air quality problem depends on the sources. So this was a, a very, this was kind of, this was, but prior to this there had been a lot of measurements in residential buildings throughout the world, but far less in office buildings. So this tells us a lot about at least these 14 buildings. Another study with lots of buildings with a few measurements in each building um, was the uh, EPA base study. It was 100 randomly selected office buildings throughout the US, four measurements in each building. They did traverses of the outdoor air intake, they also looked at peak CO2. Um, and this table right here shows, summarizes the 367 measurements that were made and we see 55 liters per second per person. Now that sounds like a lot of ventilation. Well, it is relative to the standard. And that happens for two reasons. One is many of the spaces had low occupancy rates. So the system was designed for a space with 100 people, but there were only 50 people in there. So when we divided the ventilation rate by the number of people, we got a big number. So you have four minutes, please. We, another reason it's high is a lot of these systems were running with economizer cycles. In the US, in some parts of the times of the year, it's more energy efficient to, to cool the building with outdoor air than to turn on the mechanical cooling equipment. So that raised the rates as well. Um, this plot on the lower left, lower right, shows the ratio of the measured air change rate to the design value under minimum conditions. And if the system was operating perfectly, they would all have a value of one. But we see many times it was below one, which is under ventilation relative to design, many situations where it's above one, which is over ventilation relative to the design and potentially, well, consuming more energy. The third is that a, a lot of measurements, almost a year of measurements in the townhouse owned and occupied by no one, none other than Lance Wallace. And here, you know, a lot of measurements. We looked at the impact of weather, fan operation and activities, a big data set, 
And the lower right, you see the air change rate as a function of temperature difference, which is fully expected, but it points that one measurement is one measurement. And to really understand, you need to look at the variety of conditions. The last study I want to highlight is a, some work we did in a test house where we measured the, the infiltration rates before and after an air tightening retrofit. And the plot in the up, on the left side is the air change rate versus delta T before and after the retrofit, um, with the, the uh, lower rates obviously being after the building was tightened, and the plot on the right being the uh, air change rate versus wind speed. So you see the effect of the, the uh, air change rate, and you see the effect of weather. So to wrap up, a few challenges uh, when you're measuring, uh, making measurements in the field. You know, is the building a single zone? You know, you, the, the technique you're using very well may assume it is, but you'd better check. Um, and while there are multi-zone methods, they're, they're complicated. Peak CO2, hopefully I made the point that the assumptions on which it's based are not always appreciated or validated. Um, to do duct traverses, you need to be able to get to the duct and you need the duct links. So remember, you can't interpret an indoor contaminant concentration without an air change rate. People mean different things when they say ventilation, so, so ask them, do you mean outdoor air or not? Um, outdoor air requirements, I mean, outdoor air, ventilation rates depend on a lot of things. A single value is a single value. And to really understand the airflow characteristics, you need to make multiple measurements. And as, as noted earlier, buildings aren't always ventilated as intended. Um, a whole bunch of references. I just, if you're not familiar with the Air Infiltration and Ventilation Center, a co-sponsor of this conference, a great source of information. And uh, with that, I wish you high ventilation rates and may they bring you great happiness. Thank you.